Um, so uh, I will be introducing the rest of the panel. Um, and then I will give my talk. And then afterwards, I'll invite them back up and we'll have a quick panel discussion where I'll ask some of my own questions. Um, and then I'll throw out the, um, the open the floor for questions. OK, so Martha Russell is executive director of MediaX at Stanford University and senior research scholar with the Human Sciences and Technology Advanced Research Institute at Stanford. She leads business alliances and interdisciplinary research for MediaX at Stanford. Russell's background spans a range of business development, innovation and technology transfer initiatives in the information sciences, agriculture, communications and microelectronics for businesses, universities and regional development organisations. Next we have Catherine Nicole Coleman. Uh, she is a digital research architect at Stanford University Libraries, working within the digital library systems and services group. She co-directs Humanities and Design, a research lab based at the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis, focusing on new modes of thinking in design and computer science to serve data-driven research in the humanities. And then finally, we have Haida Fateh. She's the executive director of Stanford's BioX operations and programs. Before BioX, Dr. Vitae served as the Associate Director of the Donald W. Reynolds Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center at Stanford. She received the Marshall D. O'Neill Award in 2013, which honors Stanford members who have made outstanding contributions to Stanford's research mission. Dr. Vitae has also helped initiate many organizations inside and outside of the United States. So today I'll be talking mainly about my PhD and my default. My PhD is an ethnographically inspired collective case study which conceptually and methodologically draws from science and technology studies, the area of STS. During the past year, I've been at Stanford following three different interdisciplinary cases across a wide variety of disciplines as they move from their research questions to building new technologies. I've collected a large amount of qualitative data through interviews, observations, documentary analysis, technological analysis, uh, and network mapping, all of which allow me to investigate and generate new insights into how interdisciplinarity happens in higher education. What I'm really working to understand is how do interdisciplinary research teams build new technologies. I'll talk in quite general terms about my work um, so that my cases are not obvious, uh, and I unfortunately can't discuss any of my data at the moment since I'm still in the process of analyzing my findings. So instead, today I'll look at some of the ideas which underpin and are at the core of my work. I'll briefly explore concepts of interdisciplinarity, both in theory and in practice, and how they might play out in different contexts and within different interdisciplinary teams. Whilst my primary research questions are not about trust and transparency, which is the theme of the seminar today, I'll end with discussing some ways that trust plays out in my research. Um, I also just wanted to note that um, for, the, for the purposes of this talk, I won't go into depth about my methodology or my theoretical framing, but in case you're interested, I'm more than happy to talk about them after. So the advent, the advent of the network society has brought with it an increasing prominence to interdisciplinary collaboration as a means of addressing our most pressing societal challenges. Many of the most complex issues require academic researchers to collaborate on solutions that transcend monodisciplinary perspectives. Despite the pervasive disciplinary silos which exist in higher education across the world, the university can act as a hub for interdisciplinary research, as you will see from the three talks which will follow me. As such, funding bodies are increasingly looking for interdisciplinary research proposals, but the effect effectiveness of the way in which interdisciplinary teams work, what interdisciplinarity actually looks like, how it works in practice, needs more attention. But in order for me to study interdisciplinarity, I first need to unpack it and understand what it actually is. So while the word interdisciplinarity is obviously very rhetorically powerful, one catch-all term doesn't provide much analytical purchase, especially since through its very nature, the actors and the stakeholders involved tend to understand and mobilize the concept in very different ways. So here's a basic definition um, I'll read to you of interdisciplinary research. 
It is a mode of research by teams that integrates information, data, techniques, tools, perspectives, concepts and theories from two or more disciplines to advance fundamental understanding or to solve problems whose solutions are beyond the scope of a single discipline or area of research practice. Great? Or is it that simple? <laughs> What makes the synthesis of approaches in interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity different to multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity? Are they all associated to some extent with boundary crossing and synthesizing different knowledge from different disciplines? Or is this purely semantics? Are they actually the same in practice? Should we prize one over the others? Do they represent different relationships and configurations between the disciplines? These are some of the questions that have been coming out of my data collection and questions that I've been exploring. The concept of interdisciplinarity and these other terms, which I'm sure you've heard a lot throughout the university, of course rely on the existence of disciplines. And despite a lot of literature which look at the epistemological, ontological, methodological framings of what is a discipline, there is no one agreed definition or approach to what a discipline is, let alone to what an interdiscipline is, if that exists even. And hypothetically, if we were to privilege interdisciplinarity above these other modes, is interdisciplinarity sing singular or does it exist on a spectrum? Can it only be created within teams or can individuals be interdisciplinary? There's clearly a need for an enhanced theoretical understanding of the phenomenon in order to acknowledge its depth and its complexities. So in the 2008 paper by Barry and Bourne, Logics of Interdisciplinarity, uh, they argue that there are multiple modes and logics of the phenomenon, each with different characteristics and attributes. And I won't talk through all of them, but just for example, the subordination service um, assumes that there's a hierarchy of disciplines working in a project, that one discipline might be privileged over another. And then projects with the logic of accountability are guided by an impetus to solve a real world problem. Uh, those with the logic of ontology view the collaborative endeavour itself as the methodology. But these concepts only scratch the surface of the potential differences between and within interdisciplinary projects. For example, areas in the hard sciences are traditionally much less attached to disciplinary identity politics than those in the social sciences or the humanities. How might the makeup of disciplines in a project change the outcomes? How might the weight of a discipline within a project affect interdisciplinarity in practice? And how might the development of new technologies by an interdisciplinary team influence that, the outcomes of that project? Once again, these are questions that have been popping up as I've been collecting my data. New and innovative technologies have been positioned as mediating artifacts in interdisciplinary research. But during my literature review, I found that many studies fail to acknowledge the, the co-creation of practices and technologies. It's been suggested that technology can be constructed through the integration of different disciplinary perspectives. And this is one, another aspect which I've been looking at. So, for example, and this doesn't come out very well on the big screen, but uh, if you look at this network map, um, each of these nodes is a different discipline and also represents uh, different disciplinary researchers within that discipline. Would it be beneficial if we were to map the technologies uh, that were being created as nodes, as well as the researchers being mapped? If we were to view the technologies emerging from the research as actors engaged in the interdisciplinarity as well, would this change how we view the practices, how we understand them and what might be the best practices for interdisciplinarity? So whilst I said at the beginning I won't go uh, deeply into my methodology, I did just want to uh, touch upon my use of actor network theory for my PhD. To investigate interdisciplinarity in the context of teams co-developing technologies and developing new knowledge uh, demands a particular type of interrogation. The complexities inherent in researching researchers necessitates an approach which can account for all the different participants, all the different technologies, the relationships which are happening within the teams. Interdisciplinary research is a form of knowledge creation and it represents an innovation in knowledge production. So producing knowledge within interdisciplinary research groups uh, is knowledge which would not have been possible for individual disciplinary researchers to produce on their own. Knowledge is an emergent product of the scholarly research process rather than something that exists out there waiting to be discovered. 
It's a network effect and it can emerge from an interdisciplinary network. This means that knowledge and technology are increasingly bound up and it's hard to separate the two when we look at interdisciplinarity. And finally, I said that I would discuss uh, where trust fits into my research and where it's emerging in some of my findings. Um, we are actually, Heidi and I were having a brief conversation about this before the panel, so I, this, this is a particularly interesting uh, point that I'd like to talk about in the panel later. Um, so firstly, I found that the ability for my participants to trust me as the methodologically entangled yet politically agnostic um, ethnographer was very important. <laughs> Secondly, the capacity for the teams to trust each other um, and not necessarily to buy into each other's disciplines, but to trust that each other, uh, trust their own ontological and epistemolo epistemological backgrounds. And then thirdly, uh, I found a form of trust in, trust in the loosest sense between the researcher participants and the technologies that they are building. So if the technologies that they're building are emerging as co-participants in the interdisciplinary research networks, then this will be particularly important. Uh, just to show you one example of where the theme of trust has been emerging, as I mentioned, I can't talk about the data um, that I've been collecting for the past year just yet, as I'm still analysing my findings. But uh, this is uh, an example of the four case studies I looked at during my pilot project, which uh, I undertook for my Masters at Oxford. So um, along the left are the four different interdisciplinary projects I looked at. And then here are the researchers that were engaged in the projects, and they, I also looked at the technologies that they were developing. So just to give you an example, um, uh, I'll hone in on the poetry visualizations, project two. Um, the project had, had created a poetry analysis tool. It was a piece of software um, between the three researchers. And the poet said to me during the research, the thinking um, she did about poetry in response to the project is thinking that she probably wouldn't have done without the pressure of the machine. It had, somewhat to her surprise, intensified her lifelong practice of observing how poems operate. So the trust she gained not only in the software, but also in the other researchers, uh, the linguist and the computer scientist who co-created the technology with her uh, was notable. Uh, as you've probably noticed, I've asked a lot more questions than I've answered during my talk. <laughs> Um, and I apologise, I couldn't talk more about the data I've collected during this year, but the questions I've asked, um, I would be really interested in discussing further during the panel. Um, and after the panel as well, I'd be really grateful for any audience comments on my research, uh, any of the questions I've asked. Thank you very much. I really like the questions that you're asking, Erin. And um, uh, I will speak somewhat from the front lines of uh, someone who has been involved not only in studying interdisciplinary research initiatives, but also in uh, making them happen in a number of environments over the past um, couple of years. And I think we have to start out by saying, you know, why do something that's interdisciplinary? Collaboration is not easy. And especially when people are speaking other languages, they use terms that are different. They may want to publish in different journals. Uh, their graduate students uh, come to the research activities with different backgrounds. Uh, it's challenging. Interdisciplinary um, activities are challenging. But there are several reasons what, that it's worthwhile to pursue. One is that um, people come to interdisciplinary activities because they think there might be some resources there. I might, there might be some equipment that I get to use if I'm on an interdisciplinary team that I won't have access to otherwise. There might be some financial resources that I can apply for if I'm on a team that is larger than just an individual. I might get access to data. I might be able to travel to um, collect the data or to give presentations. So these are opportunities that have resources in them that are draws to researchers. And that attracts them. Another and very important is the access to high caliber talent. Interdisciplinary research can allow someone, can facilitate, enable someone to be able to collaborate with a person with a different expertise. And the, uh, the lure of working with an expert in another field 
uh, is very powerful in terms of uh, access to the colleagues, access to students, maybe access to a new subject um, pool for the data collection. Um, the third uh, attractor for interdisciplinary research uh, is the possibility of increased visibility and recognition for a researcher's uh, professional reputation. One can build a reputation within a field, but at a certain point, getting outside of that box requires collaboration outside of the field. And, and interdisciplinary collaborations open up this possibility. My favorite is that there is an opportunity to ask better questions. If the questions are not confined to those issues that a discipline has said, this is our field, these are the questions that we're going to ask, these are the methods we're going to use to study them, these are the proofs that we will use to know if the research is well done. Getting outside that box can open up a whole world of better questions and better solutions. One additional uh, motive for interdisciplinary research, and I think this is one that may appeal more at the administrative level of higher education institutions and also of companies that engage uh, in research that is basic enough that they understand the concept of interdisciplinary research, is that the interdisciplinary activity can refresh, energize the disciplines. I mean, we have interdisciplinary because we have disciplines, right? But disciplines, if they stay just as they are, can become out of date. And the interdisciplinary juices those disciplines. Um, and in some of the assignments that I've had uh, previously, I've had the opportunity to look at the way that you can see that this happens within a discipline, that the people are publishing in new journals, there are new courses being offered. There are um, new uh, research topics that are introduced. And uh, new pools of graduate students are pulled in. So I think these are very compelling reasons to do it. Why is it challenging? Well, a couple of reasons. You know, we may, people may be collaborating, but in the end, they take home separate paychecks. They are rewarded with incentives, promotions, recognition, most of the time in individual ways. Teamwork is different, is, is difficult, and uh, people don't always agree on what should be done or how it should be done. And the necessity of negotiating that in the context of interdisciplinary research uh, is uh, challenging. Disciplines have discipline, which in some respects means that they are provincial. And so getting outside that um, box, finding the peers that can review an interdisciplinary research proposal is challenging. Finding the journals that will accept uh, the publication of interdisciplinary research is challenging. Uh, the fourth uh, challenge that I will mention is that <clears throat> While interdisciplinary research generally tends to be uh, lauded uh, in academic institutions and in business research organizations, it does happen that management issues sometimes trump the leadership opportunities that are re represented by interdisciplinary activities. In other words, budgetary restrictions, IP restrictions, many of these management issues sometimes do trump the leadership that uh, emerges in interdisciplinary research. But it has a lot of potential. And uh, in activities that uh, I've done previously, I think cartoons may kind of bring to life some of the issues. One of those is who's going to run the program? And we've all seen the tension in interdisciplinary research of the group variables and the task focus variables. In other words, uh, the opportunity to make everybody feel that they are contributing, that they're part of the solution, and, and the need to get things done. 
and the person who self-identifies or is identified as the group process lead. Uh, the person who says, no, I have the right way and I'm going to tell you how it should be done, they exist and they often stimulate uh, a need for coordination. And sometimes the coordination, you know, uh, leans a little bit toward conformity rather than expressing differences that actually enrich the collaboration. The way that leadership emerges and changes over a period of time as the group continues working together uh, is complex and um, groups uh, differ in the way that they, in their ability to embrace the differences that actually bring them together to do the research. But also, one can find that a group that is together for a period of time begins to kind of act like a married couple. They can finish each other's sentences. And the staleness in the intellectual vitality that sets in there um, is uh, an opportunity for intervention or for uh, a, a new interdisciplinary uh, activity to be identified. Well. I also pay very close attention to the um, relationship that academic researchers have with uh, the business community. MediaX is um, a bridge and a catalyst to stimulate those activities. And some of the same challenges that exist for interdisciplinary research exist for um, the relationships, research relationships and collaborations between industry and university. The drivers are different. In uh, the university, we want papers, we want publications, we want uh, graduates. In the business community, we're in, they're interested in patents, they're interested in new products and moving those along. The timelines are different. Our time cycle in the university, if you look at the time that it takes to produce a new PhD, is five to seven years. If you're working in digital media, the time cycles may be five to seven seconds. If you're working in the pharmaceutical industry, they may be longer, but uh, they don't always match up to the industry, uh, to the university time cycles. And the incentives are different. Uh, there aren't many universities that offer bonuses for extraordinary work that's done at the end of the year. And the language is different. Well, all of this means that trust and reciprocity are the vehicles, they are the currencies, I want to say, that help to make the interdisciplinary research, um, uh, interdisciplinary interaction and industry university interaction work. A prime capital, a uh, prime asset, is relational capital. And this is trust. This is reciprocity that people have with each other. And this is built through experience. Uh, it can be lost in the very same way. It means it, it relies on dependability, on honesty, on humility. And I like to say that agency for each other is one of the keys as well. That in an interdisciplinary team that is functioning well or in an industry university collaboration that is humming along, people are agents for the interests of the other. So uh, transparency also is critical here. And uh, it is transparency that helps people to overcome their biases, that uh, helps them to widen the lens of possibility so that they can get some insights that they didn't even know to look for, uh, that they can invite challenges and strengthen the explanation the widening of possibilities. I have had the great fortune of working with a number of very successful business leaders. Uh, one of them was Bill Norris, uh, who founded Control Data Corporation. And with his personal wealth after he retired, he had about 20 years to invest in socio-technical experimental activities. And he believed very strongly that uh, turbulence fuels innovation. But he could not believe the response 
that he got from the University of Minnesota when he said uh, we had established um, Microelectronic and Information Sciences Center, one of the first pre-competitive, industry-sponsored pre-competitive research programs. I could not believe the response of the faculty members who said, I'm not sharing equipment with anyone, even if you give it to me. If I have a molecular beam epitaxy machine, I don't want some, and I'm working on gallium arsenide research, I don't want somebody uh, running another material through it. I, w I won't do my research that way. He could not believe that. So um, it is challenging to get people to work together to trust each other. And uh, I think that Media X, as a catalyst at Stanford, um, where people have a passion for the relevance to the business community, and there's an entrepreneurial context that comes from Silicon Valley. And because of the level of research that takes place at Stanford, there is competition for the best question. And I think this is one of the very best uh, opportunities for interdisciplinary research to thrive because a focus on the uh, question uh, allows people to be agents of transformation for each other. Um, just a word about MediaX. Uh, as an ecosystem for discovery collaboration at the intersection of human sciences and information technologies. There have been a number of uh, research projects that we have sponsored. We're a member supported organization, uh, about 120 now. This shows the various fields in which they have been conducted. Uh, Aaron was one of the authors on this study. And the College of Engineering, the Graduate School of Education, uh, Humanities and Sciences, Law and Medicine have all been uh, part of this. And looking at the uh, way that relationships over a period of time through the themes that we have brought to bear and the uh, collaborations that have uh, taken place among faculty members from various disciplines really do see an emergence of a shared vision uh, a passion for understanding, for working with others to open the realm of possibilities. But I think that a couple things are important, and that is um, in interdisciplinary research, do you call it a facilitation, or I don't like the word management, enabling, never forget the goals. And I think for me to X, the goals are to add value to the intellectual capital at Stanford University and to do something together with our industry partners that they couldn't do or we could do by ourselves uh, and to do that in a way that leverages technology to enhance the human experience. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Haida Fati. I'm from BioX. And uh, Aaron, I couldn't have choreographed this better myself, so fantastic job choreographing the whole thing. And Martha, thank you so much for your talk because you really set the scene for me, so thank you. It was a fantastic talk. I'll be your agent. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I'll be yours. Um, uh, thank you so much. So, um, BioX started about 1998, and as Martha said, there was advantages, advantages of starting uh, interdisciplinary programs on campus. Uh, President Hennessy at that time thought that the sum of the product of what we can bring together, working together, is a lot larger than if we were working in our individual silos. There were several faculty that followed that lead and worked together. They had postdocs together, PhD students together. And very soon, the BioX program was formed. This is back in 1998. Um, to jumpstart the program, President Hennessy actually uh, put some funding into the program to get faculty together and give some uh, seed funds so that faculty can start working together. And very soon, we uh, were uh, lucky enough to get some uh, funding from Jim Clark and have a hub where we could bring the BioX program together. So then the uh, BioX program started, and uh, our mission, which is to catalyze discovery and crossing of the boundaries between disciplines to bring interdisciplinary solutions and to create new knowledge of biological system and benefit of human health, started. 
BioX is really a model for high performance research that universities can operate across disciplines. It's a web of interconnected and collaborative scientists across entire campus. Just recently, a couple of years ago, uh, the National Academy of Science actually coded that an, it's an interdisciplinary success story and BioX is leading the model for conducting biosciences research. So we were very proud to see this at the National Academy of Science level. Uh, we're, we actually, um, we try to educate a new breed of scientists, Nobel laureates, high, uh, highly sought faculty and rising young scientists and engineers all benefit from working together. And as I mentioned, the product of our work together is a lot larger than us working in our individual silos. How do we accomplish this? How do we bring people together? We have a series of uh, programs for faculty, for faculty, for uh, PhD students and postdocs, and for undergraduate students, just to bring people together, to work together. And we have a hub, the Clark Center. It's, uh, it's located uh, very strategically between humanities and sciences, medicine, and engineering. And from all over the university, there's paths to make it to the Clark Center. And um, great things about the Clark Center is not only we have 50 faculty from 28, di 28 different departments in the building, we have shared facilities, open lab spaces, uh, we have a nice restaurant to bring people together and you'd be amazed how much interdisciplinary work can get us started right here at the restaurant and cafe when people get together and sit and talk while they're having coffee or a sandwich together. We have spaces where people can actually meet. We have about 8,000 meetings held at the Clark Center every year. And people actually use these spaces to get together and do collaborative work. To tell you a little, little bit about our programs, for our faculty, we have this seed grant program. We provide faculty funding to come together, propose a research that they wouldn't do in their individual silos, but coming together, they, they propose, a, they propose a, a project and they come together and work together. Within the past 16 years, we have gone through eight rounds of seed grant proposals. We have funded 187 teams of faculty. Altogether, through our programs, we have been able to bring over 3,000 teams of faculty together to work together. As Martha was saying, we give them incentives to come together. And once they accomplish, they see that it's a good thing and they keep doing it again, over and over again. So some of our faculty have teamed up with different people during the past 18 years and have uh, come, come together to do different projects. Um, our PhD students, we have funded about 248 students so far. Uh, 22 more actually are uh, just got their awards this year. We just announced this uh, second, to this last 22 students this year. And uh, undergraduate students as well, they can get a 10 week summer program. Um, they come to labs, they learn how to do research, and they get a taste of interdisciplinary research. We bring them together every Wednesday afternoon, um, and they listen to talks from four different faculty, and they get to talk to four different faculty. So we really um, try to empower faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students to actually do interdisciplinary research. The seed grants, as I mentioned to you, uh, we've gone through eight rounds. 187 seed grants have been awarded. 20 more will be awarded in October. Through the seed grants, 900 interdisciplinary teams have come together. The results of it, as far as funding goes, the amount of funding that we have put into the program has returned, has had over tenfold return in investment. We've uh, been able to bring back, based on faculty report, reports, about $280 million in Stanford for research. 
88 patents have been filed so far from the 187 awards. And there has been hundreds of publications in peer-reviewed journals from, from the research that has been done. This is an interaction that Daniel McFarlane, actually, from the School of Education, helped us put together. And it, I have a... <laughs> This has a little movie underneath this. How can I get this to play that? It's, it's a tiny one. It's not much. It's just a slide forwarding. It's an interactum that many, Daniel McFarland took all our uh, data from um, all the data from our uh, website right there, if you just started, and showed how we increased the number of faculty collaborations. The different colors are people from different schools. And then the connecting dots show how much collaborations they've done. And you saw how that grew in the years that come. So um, trying to keep track of time. Oh my god, time flies. <laughs> Uh, the result of some of the work, uh, one is Symbios, which is simulation biology. It's a software that now tens of thousands of lab groups are using. And uh, this was done by a group of faculty. Uh, $200,000, $150,000 seed grant became $37 million in funding from NIH. Um, this is another, another project that was funded. This also has some sounds. I'm not going to bother you with going through that. But this was a faculty from the music department, actually, that got together from a medical doctor in neurology. And they built this device where they can actually detect epilepsy. So once this device is put on the brain of a child with epilepsy, for example, at school, um, music plays. And depending on the sound of the music that is playing, his mother, her, his, her father could tell how severe of an issue the attack is. Um, those are the sounds. I'm not going to play them. Our fellowships are the only fellowships that I believe on campus where students are self-nominated. We don't give the funding to the school. We don't give the funding to the department. Students get to do what they're passionate about doing. They work with two faculty, come up with a project. We give them the funding. They do the work. So they actually are excited about what they're doing. Uh, we funded about 248 students so far and since 2004. And we, uh, it's a three-year funding for PhD students starting their second or third year. So after that, we gave them three, uh, three years of funding. Uh, how much time do I have? One minute? One minute? Oh, my goodness. OK. Um, so this, uh, this faculty here used to be one of our graduate students. He is now a faculty in the structure of biology. Um, his students are getting funding from us. And now she's graduated. And she, she has a job at Google. So. And this is one of their projects. Uh, I'm not going to get into the detail, but um, this is what we used to see with this imaging system. But with the system that they built, this is what we can see inside of the eye. This is amazing. If I could get into it and tell you what they've actually done. Um, this is how, where, where our students end up. 99.9% uh, .9 of our students that have graduated have jobs. This is unheard of. They're either doing postdocs, they're MDs, they're faculty, or they're at the industry or started their own programs or their, their own companies. Um, our undergraduate students are uh, extremely uh, successful. Uh, they're also graduating, becoming MDs, starting their own programs. And we've so far funded about 501 students. This summer, we're going to have 64 more students. Um, I can't get into the industry, but I think I'm going to end, end up not having enough time. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Or... Thank you. No slides for me. Um, as Erin said, I'm Nicole Coleman. I'm um, with uh, the library uh, and also Humanities Plus Design, which is one of the research labs at SESTA, the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis. Um, wow, $280 million. Can't even imagine. <laughs> Last week uh, was the inaugural meeting for Stanford's Human-Centered AI Initiative. 
which is directed by Fei-Fei Li, um, associate professor in computer science, uh, and also head of the, the Stanford AI lab and the Stanford Vision Lab. Um, so Fei-Fei Li and John Echimendi are both um, uh, directing this new initiative. Um, Fei-Fei Li is personally dedicated to addressing the need for diversity in AI and to make sure that AI technologies are informed by a wide range of human concerns. Her project, for example, AI for All in particular, is dedicated to bringing diversity to AI through uh, education. So we're really, really fortunate at Stanford to have her at the helm of this new initiative. So you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with interdisciplinary research? Maybe this is like the next. But I want, I want to talk about this because um, the work that we've been doing at Humanities Plus Design Lab, um, where we're collaboratively building digital research tools with humanists, designers, engineers, and computer scientists, um, has shown that we can actually encode humanities thinking into computational tools. So what I want to do is share with you why I think it's so important in the context of these very powerful new technologies um, of artificial intelligence, um, these technologies that have a hold on us now, um, particularly here at Stanford and in Silicon Valley in general, why it's so important that we think about um, interdisciplinarity in the context of building these tools. Um, so Fei Fei Li wrote recently this um, New York Times um, op-ed piece um, all explaining human-centered AI, um, saying that it's really about making AI that's good for people. So to achieve that end, uh, it's understood that computer science is going to need to engage with other disciplines. Uh, she specifically suggests in that article connecting AI with fields um, from which many of the ideas underpinning machine intelligence arose, like neuroscience, cognitive science, psychology, and sociology. Um, and so this pertains, this kind of collaboration pertains to her first goal of human-centered AI, which is reflecting more of the depth that characterizes our own intelligence. Right? Logical that you would go to neuroscience, um, psychology, cognitive science. But I want to make the case that the humanities also can contribute significantly to this first goal. In fact, the range of disciplines within the liberal arts are concerned with human con the human condition, um, our cultural heritage, and the meaning of our existence. So understanding the questions that humanists ask can go a long way to understanding what separates us from machines, since machines are applied to solving problems rather than making meaning. Uh, first, engaging with humanists in the earliest days would probably have solved the locution problem. Right, that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligent. Humanists would make it clear that words really matter, that they have meaning, that they capture the imagination, and that they have consequences. There's some who might fantasize about a Hollywood version of AI, um, of like you know, robots taking over the world. Um, but, but most computer scientists acknowledge that machines are not intelligent and that they don't really learn. But if we continue to confuse machine learning with the kind of learning that humans do, it can lead to very real problems, like treating K through 12 education as an engineering problem rather than a human problem, or using student test scores as a proxy for teacher effectiveness. Engaging with humanists could also help us determine what kinds of problems we really need to solve if the goal is to make our lives better. Um, and my hint here is it's not just about having a machine do things for us. Um, and this is suggested by Fei-Fei Li's second goal with human-centered AI, which is um, to ensure that AI technologies are enhancing us, not replacing us. To give you an example of what I mean by this is, um, I have a dishwashing machine, and um, I don't really need it. Most of the time, it's not necessary. There are just two of us at home. But it is particularly helpful when we have lots of guests over. It means that we can spend more time with our guests right, and let the machine wash the dishes. But the kind of household machine that I find really, really useful, because I've done a lot of work on my house, um, is a power drill. It's versatile, helps me do things that I want to do faster with less effort according to my design. That's a huge difference, right? Something that's just going to fulfill a task independently, press a button and it runs, versus something that does exactly what I want it to do. That's enhancing, right? Um, augmenting. Um, there's so many AI-assisted technologies that try too hard to do a task for me 
rather than augment the work that I want to do. Many of you may have seen or heard just last week or the week before about Duplex, which was unveiled at the recent Google Developers Conference. Um, the Google CEO demonstrated this Duplex, which is an automated assistant, um, by making an appointment to get a haircut. Um, and one of the things that he said is, you know, we're working really hard to get users through those moments. Right? Like, I don't really need help making a haircut <laughs> appointment. I mean, you know, it's not just a, a, a crying need that I have. Um, but more important than what my needs are, um, you know, how would I feel duping my hairdresser with a machine instead of me? I, I actually have a personal relationship um, with her. Um, I would actually miss that human engagement. Um, there's also the, well, the, the concern, naturally ethical concerns, not only um, you know, of duping another human being, but of putting people out of jobs, which is a, a, a huge topic. Um, Sundar Pichai, the, the CEO, also unveiled um, this uh, Gmail assistant, which is called Smart Compose, which is like predictive text that offers you phrases as you type within Gmail. So you're just typing an email message, and um, it can build up to, to, to whole sentences for you. Um, and it's described as being designed to tailor its predictions to each individual user based on information that Google already knows about you. Um, there, there's so much that's wrong with that, I think. In a, um, I don't want to be predictable myself. Um, life is not predictable. I haven't had a chance to try this Smart Compose yet, but I have um, used Smart Reply, or it's sort of, it, it, it offers itself to me by default. Um, if you use Gmail, you've probably seen this. You compose a message, um, or you start to compose a message, it gives you answers. So recently, I received a message from my partner who was struggling with how to respond to our friend's request to end his life. Google's smart reply suggested, sounds good, or I like it. We've seen the failure to understand the complexity of human beings, of human behavior, create really serious consequences with Facebook very recently in news um, and with autonomous vehicles. The dangers of weaponized human data collection have hit a high point with Project Maven, a collaboration that Google's Alphabet has entered into with the Department of, De of Defense, which aims to improve the ability of drones to identify humans, determining which humans are targets and which humans should not be targets. Um, this ties in with Fei Fei Li's last point, uh, that human-centered AI should ensure that the development of this technology is guided at each step by concern for its effect on humans. Um, let me give you an example of uh, humanity's collaboration from a project that was funded by this human-centered AI seed grant. Um, the paper is titled Correcting Gender and Ethnic Biases in AI Algorithms. Um, it was a collaboration between computer science, electrical engineering, linguistics, and history. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly read you um, the, the abstract from that paper. Uh, word embeddings use vectors to represent words such that the geometry between vectors captures semantic relationships between the words. In this paper, we develop a framework to demonstrate how the temporal dynamics of the embedding can be leveraged to quantify changes in stereotypes and attitudes toward women and ethnic minorities in the 20th and 21st centuries in the United States. We integrate word embeddings trained on 100 years of text data with the US Census to show that changes in the embedding track closely with demographic and occupational shifts over time. And it goes on. Um, and I'll give you just one example of the results from that paper, uh, which is just really fascinating. Um, adjectives associated with Asian. In 1910, the adjectives associated with Asian, by looking at the word embeddings, Irresponsible, envious, barbaric, aggressive, transparent, monstrous, hateful, cruel, greedy, bizarre. As of 1990, which is like the end of the period of their study, um, inhibited, passive, dissolute, haughty, complacent, forceful, fixed, active, sensitive, hardy. Big shift and change over time. Um, 
so I, I consider this paper a tremendous success for the Human Centered AI initiative and you know, for their seed grant process. Um, but what is really powerful to me in this is that bias in this paper is most often addressed, not within this paper, bias is most often addressed within the context of computer science alone, within the confines of that discipline, um, as a problem that needs to be solved. Um, and sort of the somewhat subtle difference here is that rather than bias as being something that needs to be eliminated, in this collaboration, bias was treated as historical evidence not to be removed, but to be analyzed and explored for what it tells us about ourselves. In other words, if we address and become sensitive to harmful human bias, we're less likely to build systems than encode bias. We can't program it out of the machine. We have to work on ourselves. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, they were both fantastic talks. Um, unfortunately, Haida had to run off to another engagement. We will run the panel now. So um, I wondered, fitting with the theme of the, the seminar series uh, and the panel overall, um, a very broad question. Uh, I wondered how do you think that we can encourage trust and transparency in interdisciplinary research collaborations, whatever that might mean to you? Ah, that's a great question. I think that um, yeah, I'm going to take a relationship approach, uh, and that's the lens that I often look through. I think that it's a, a relationship that uh, people have with each other, and uh, if they are honest about their motives for wanting to work together, uh, then I think that uh, they are uh, able to establish a trusting relationship. But I also think that humility is important in coming into uh, a relationship with someone who has a different expertise uh, requires a humility about my own expertise uh, that is saying I'm willing to open up what I think might be an explanation, what I think might be a way of doing this to your suggestions and to, you know, if there are differences, to try to understand how there's something that we can come together uh, and agree upon uh, as a way that we would be working together. I think without that trust and without, uh, I think, an understanding of what do I want the collaboration to be, how does it mesh with what you want the collaboration to be, I think there can be um, a lack of trust which can uh, prevent people from sharing openly, uh, encourage kind of withholding some of the information that might uh, lead to a wider range of possibilities in talking about the phenomenon, and um, probably bog the process down, make it take longer, make it be more expensive. Um, I'm sometimes asked what it costs to do interdisciplinary research. And um, although I try to always be polite in an answer like that, the truth is that if people want to work together and they trust each other, it costs a lot less. I wondered if you had any um, Yeah, well, I would absolutely second what, what Martha said. Um, one way that that has taken shape within um, our collaborations within Humanity Social Design is we always talked about um, with collaborators having a complementary research agenda instead of a shared research agenda, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, in our literature, at least, you know, within Stanford, um, uh, there is a, the, the terminology is shared research agenda, but I, I think that um, a problem with that sometimes is it means um, there's a lot of compromise to we're all looking for the same result. And that can be problematic. Um, because part of the um, you know, building trust and building respect um, and having humility, as Martha was saying, is understanding that all of the different disciplinary pr perspectives that are coming into play have something different and valuable. Um, to to you know give it, it also goes to your point about uniformity um, from your your cartoon it's it's not about uniformity it's about all the the unique different diverse perspectives um, that come into play and um, I know that you know we didn't come to that notion just out of the blue um, 
I was really inspired fairly early on in, in our work by um, uh, Myra Strober's um, interdisciplinary conversations. Um, so jumping off of that, you mentioned the uh, importance of a complementary research agenda. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, your talk focusing on human-centered AI. Um, there's been a lot of talk about AI recently and interdisciplinarity within AI, within AI. So I think that's definitely a future trend within the university. But I wondered, what do you see as the future um, or other topics that will be uh, prevalent in the future of interdisciplinary research in the university? Other topics that could come to the university. Uh, I've heard several recent, I've heard one recently that's quite intriguing to me, and that uh, concerns the use of data by different parties, um, especially when they uh, may be using it for different purposes, but it may be the same data. And that uh, research topic, I think, goes to what can, how can consensus be developed among the people who are using data for different purposes? And that consensus might have to do with how the provenance or the tagging of that data will take place, how the, um, how the validity of that data can be assured. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that's a big, very fundamental uh, question that we may deal with. I'm just thinking about your question in, in light of the, um, the, the presentations that we've seen. Um, I, of course, I have a particular bias, as you saw in my presentation, I'm looking at this from the you know, standpoint of the, um, of the humanities. Uh, I, I would certainly like to... Um, there's so many potential points of, um, of, of intersection with, with the, a range of research that's going on. Um, uh, it's almost, yeah, I don't know, it's almost too many to, to point to any particular one that I can um, think of. But we're certainly through the kind of almost inevitable throwing together that that you were um, showing us Aaron in, in your presentation of like it's there's a certain degree of um, of, uh, of kind of co-working and sharing of information that's almost unavoidable because of um, the the internet and uh, and the, the ways in which we access information um, I would like to think that um, there'll be a lot more emphasis on um, those the ways in which we can distinguish ourselves and actually distinguish the disciplines. I mean, you know, the, they're the challenges of working together, but at the same time, there's a real problem um, of throwing sort of everything into the same pot. And in a way, that's um, the way that we pursue knowledge has changed so dramatically now because of Google. I have to bring a AI into it some way. Um, and it's it has um, sort of um, flattened significantly um, the, the distinctions um, of what are the meaningful intellectual contributions to be made from each different discipline. Um, so, you know, it's in a way it's sort of a reverse uh, interdisciplinarity in order to emphasize um, the distinctions. Okay. I was hoping you'd say meaning because you mentioned mm. that in your presentation and yeah. I think that where there is meaning to be explored uh, that's a great interdisciplinary um, opportunity. Mm -hmm.